November 26, 2010. Black Friday. John Skelton went for an early morning drive. 429, he's about 3.3 miles from his home. 5 a.m., uh, he's near Holiday City. And then at 646, approximately, he's back home. It's this window of time that I, I suspect that, um, you know, he did something with the boys. Physical, real evidence of murder is the missing link for prosecutors and police. What they have is a map of movement from the early morning hours of Black Friday 2010. John's cell phone moving from his house in Morency to Holiday City, Ohio. As you know, lead investigator Jeremy Brewer of the Michigan State Police is now quarterbacking this thing. WDIV reporter Sandra Ali and I met up with Detective Brewer in Morency, behind the police station. We're, we're in Morency right now. This is where John departed from, right? Correct. This meeting was set up so that Officer Brewer could drive us down to Holiday City, following the same path investigators believe John Skelton took, early morning, day after Thanksgiving, 2010. This was uh, the very early morning hours of what would be referred to as Black Friday. So at approximately 4.29 a.m., um, the phone records do indicate that John Skelton left his residence, which is located at 112 Congress Street in the city of Morency, and we show that uh, that phone was on for approximately 20 to 25 minutes, um, and that was in, traveled in the direction of uh, northwest of Morency into Ohio. And so once we um, learned that information, uh, that kind of gave us a little bit of a focus to um, direct our investigators and our search parties. And that's what, what we did. Um, the next timestamp that we do get from him is basically around um, a little bit before 5 a.m. That phone went silent. The phone going silent means it stopped connecting with towers. Which means the cell phone either went dead or was turned off. Or the GPS in the phone was somehow disabled. Is that typical when someone's trying to hide something? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if someone's going to be leaving their house at the wee hours of the morning, they would, you know, one would think that a, a normal prudent person would try to make sure their phone was was charged and ready just because it's not a normal time for someone to be leaving, especially on a holiday weekend uh, with three boys that were supposed to be back with their mother the following day. So that was very suspicious to us. We're passing through downtown Morency now then by the park that's now home to the Boys Monument. It's quite amazing to me to, to when I look back at um, how this event turned this city upside down. And even now, seven years, almost seven years later, um, it's still very much on, on people's minds and in people's hearts. And, uh, but yes, it's, it's, it's very strange to think that, uh, you know, whether the, we don't know for sure if the boys were even in the car. You know, we, we don't have that information. We don't know. Um, one would think that if he was leaving his house with three young boys that they, they would be. Um, but as investigators, we have to think of all options, and um, they could or they could not have been in that vehicle at that time. We just we don't have that information. But either way, he definitely, that morning, whatever he did, um, he was driving right through the city in this, possibly this very route um, that, uh, you know, has been a mystery for this entire time. This drive to Holiday City was just one road trip of many I've been on lately. I recently made my way out to Eaton Rapids to visit Larry Weeks. He was the first investigator on the case. And even though he's got a new job in a new town, he did tell me a while back how much he still thinks about the skeletons. As I'm sitting here in my office talking with you, I'm looking at the bulletin board across the other room, and I have the, the boys' uh, missing poster uh, mounted there. So The first thing I look for once I get to Chief Weeks' office is the missing poster. And there it is. It's pinned into a corkboard. It's directly across the room from his desk. And to the right of his desk, there's a framed newspaper, the Daily Telegram. And it reads, You're nothing but a coward. There's a picture of John Skelton in an orange jumpsuit, sitting at a defense table inside a courtroom. He drove pretty much straight based on the timing. It had been hard for him to stop between... The chief doesn't hold back that he wishes he was still a big part of the investigation. But he moved on. Another opportunity presented itself. I asked him if he remembered certain meetings, theories, and personalities. If there's a meeting that sticks out in my mind, um, it's the meeting in which we more thoroughly briefed her on where we were at, um, our position, that they were likely murdered. Um, 
that was, as I think I said before, the most difficult meeting uh, I've ever participated in. And um, to have those conversations with Tanya was extraordinarily hard. And I don't know that you know, I stopped crying for several you know, hours even after that meeting was over. I was so angry and frustrated and uh, um, disappointed that we couldn't bring resolution yet to her and, and, uh, and her family and, and the boys' extended family. Um, it was just tough. It wasn't easy for anyone. The, the child abduction cases, those, those haunt you. Former Special Agent Andy Arena of the FBI, he remembers this case for many reasons. But the one glaring thing, the one thing that sticks out to him, is the way John Skelton just used people. I, I almost think he was reveling in the fact that, you know, he was almost like jerking the chain of the investigators, you know. Um, so to me, it wasn't one thing. It, it seemed to be just the, kind of the whole... Um, the whole timeline and the way he kept changing the story. Arena said John's behavior from the beginning was troubling. He knew that time was only working against them. You know, within the first day or two, if you don't find those kids, it's it's not going to end well. And so we were trying to to locate them as quickly as possible. Which brings us back to our trip to Holiday City with Detective Brewer, where we're tracking the drive that John likely took on Black Friday, 2010. John was driving the family's blue minivan. Investigators knew that to be true. But John, to this day, hasn't told them where he was going that morning. No, he did not. Investigator Brewer also gives a few details about the alleged suicide attempt, saying the botched suicide happened within a couple hours of arriving back at his home in Morency. From the evidence that we have, it was an attempt at hanging, basically, from a stair banister. Uh, the, the rope, um, or the instrument he used, was very thin could not hold the body weight and from what we gathered and our best our best information is that he fell and he suffered an injury to his ankle and that is why he ended up going to the hospital and this was um, sometime the last time we have his phone showing back at his house was at 6 46 in the morning and this injury occurred sometime within you know two hours of our last phone phone connection back at the house at, in, on Congress Street. Does he admit to the to going down to Holiday City? I mean, obviously you have to, you can say, look, we, we followed your cell phone. Not directly, no. Do you think this is where John Skelton was that morning? Yes. I do. We're only about halfway through our drive now. Detective Brewer flips down his visor to shield his eyes. You've heard me detail the landscape before, as rural as rural can get. I'm trying to picture it at about 5 in the morning, pitch black, no lights overhead. This drive would be quiet, dark, can't imagine any traffic. Surrounded by cornfields, stalks probably yellowed from the chilled November air. It's a good route if you wish to be discreet. A good route if you don't want to get caught doing something you shouldn't be doing like putting your boys into a car under a blanket of darkness without telling anyone, with intentions of making them disappear. He had a plan in place for doing something. And if he started to enact that plan at 4.30 in the morning when he left his residence, um, I believe that there would be too many loose ends um, and too many risks of leaving the boys at the house for... If one of them woke up and dad wasn't home, they could have easily came out of the house, went to a neighbor's house, went to the mother's house just a few blocks up the road. And so uh, I firmly believe that when he left the house that morning due to the plan he had, whatever that might be, that the boys were with him um, for the simple fact that if one of the boys would have uh, been left at the house and made contact with someone else, then his plan would have um, been disrupted. Lieutenant Detective Brewer is one of the very few people that speaks with John. He talks with him from time to time, trying to see if John will say something new, something interesting, maybe slip up and give out a detail that he hasn't given before. But it's a delicate process, one that can't be heavy-handed or too direct. When I talk to John Skelton, he does not uh, respond to any questions related to what happened that night. How does he respond when you ask him about it? He just, he just won't talk about it. 
he will not respond and we don't we're not even I'm not even given the opportunity to um, go down that path with him nor have, nor have I pushed it quite honestly when the boys come up in conversation he gets very quiet sometimes emotional um, and we can talk about a lot of different things uh, whether that's the weather um, sports his family um, different things just the, a normal conversation that two guys would have um, and then when the context of the boys in the situation comes up it's an immediate the walls go up and he shuts down John shutting down seems to be something we've heard before something we've heard from Tanya many times and while we're thinking of Tanya it's important to remember that Tanya was John's second marriage you know, he was very much protecting himself from getting hurt. He had a previous marriage uh, in the past that did not go well, some other relationships that have not ended well. And so whatever panic and whatever feeling he had at the time, um, he felt like he had removed the boys from the situation in order to, uh, in my opinion, in order to show the world that no one was going to get the better of him. What we do know, uh, and going into the, the mind of John Skelton and his life story, is that in the previous relationships that he has had, um, none of them have worked out well. And in his mind, every female that he has been connected with has turned on him and made his life miserable. Whatever he might have done with the boys to cause their disappearance, I believe that he did this not to protect their safety, but to show the family and show the world that no one was gonna get the better of him. And almost like, I'll show you Type, type of mindset, and that's what I believe happened. Selfish John. From the perspective of everyone that's been willing to talk to me, that's the consensus. Another consensus? John loved his kids. I get the idea of getting one over on Tanya. That makes sense in its own twisted way. The part that I can't understand is hurting your children to do it. We'll be right back. I want to tell you about another podcast from WDIV and Graham Media. It's called Mismatch, hosted by veteran reporter Roger Weber. Each episode tells stories about things in life that just don't quite fit. One episode chronicles a real-life Romeo and Juliet romance that ends in an explosive fashion. And uh, he lit the fuse, and instead of it uh, blowing up three minutes from then, it blew up in three seconds. Subscribe to Mismatch today. You, you did say you think the boys were with him. I believe so, yes. Do you think they were alive when he left that house? I can't answer that. I have no idea. I know you can't go into details, but is it possible um, that the boys were unconscious when they were transported to wherever they were transported to? Uh, that's definitely a possibility, absolutely. I mean, it could be possible they weren't in that van, but as I told you before, I believe that they were. The reason I asked that last question was, if you try to think like John on a night like that night, moving those children would have been a lot easier if they weren't awake, if they weren't moving, if they weren't asking questions. By now, we're close, crossing over the Ohio Turnpike. And... There's the sign for Holiday City, city limits. But your best guess as an investigator is that he was here in Holiday City. I believe this is a very strong possibility, is that, that he was Friday. in this area. This is the, uh, the 8090 Turnpike in Ohio. Again, it would be a very strong route that John would have uh, been familiar with, with his truck driving. Um, we coast over a bridge and into a small town. Holiday City doesn't appear to be an accurate name for this place. Two lanes of road bring you through a three to four block town, lined with motels, gas stations, a restaurant or two. Not to be rude, but it's a pretty depressing stop. This area right here that we're in right now is a very strong possibility of where the kids could have been around 5 a.m. on Black Friday back in 2010. We pull into a motel parking lot and drive around back. The place is beyond rundown. 
I would have guessed this place was closed, out of business, based on its upkeep. As we get out of the car, a Mount Pelier police officer pulls up. Detective Brewer walks over to talk with the local cop. After Brewer returned, he explained that the officer told him, we'll want to be careful. This area isn't exactly what he would call safe. Lieutenant Detective Brewer told him, we'd be fine. Initially, the investigators who were on the case thought, okay, this is where the boys are. Correct. This was, again, with all the information that we had leading up days after it happened, we really thought this was the place where we would find the boys. Holiday City is like a small island in the middle of green crops. It's right off the turnpike, so it's an easy stop off for truck drivers, uh, for people that are traveling on the highway for a quick stop. Um, There's just a couple of really small hotels and fast food places, a couple local restaurants. Um, It's not really a place where you'd... um, um, there's not a lot of things to do as far as, uh, you know, shopping or things like that. So it's mainly just a stop-off point for people traveling and things like that right in the uh, area of Montpelier, Ohio here. And so it's one of those places to where um, you normally wouldn't stay long unless you were from the area. We walk along the backside of this motel where we are completely hidden away from cars passing by on the highway, just on the other side of the structure. On our right, the parking lot is framed by a farm's field, and closer by, a dumpster. Beyond that, what looks like a garage. On our left is the motel's back wall, which is covered in mismatched paint, scars from who knows what. When we walk out past the edge of the building, there's a dirt lot. It reaches back to a field. We talked about the phone, um, the directions that the the data tower gave us to this area, Um, but Holiday City was also... Um, at least according to John Skelton, was held some importance to him uh, because the family had spent some time here. I believe him and uh, him and his wife had spent some time here. The kids had came here for a hotel stay or some type of visit. Um, as we can already see, there's trucks coming in and out. Um, and if, if he was going to do something bad, of which obviously we don't have the boys, so something, something bad happened around this area, um, he would have more than likely done that in an area where he was comfortable with. And in this area, he would have known it like the back of his hand. Uh, it's, it's a truck stop. It's a quick in and out for people on the highways. And it's only 25 minutes from, from where he lives. Oftentimes, in, when, when criminals are conducting criminal activity, uh, when the high stress is there and the anxiety is there, a lot of times they will put themselves in some type of comfortability, comfortable situation um, to where they're familiar with some of the surroundings so that that's at least one less thing to be anxious about. I'm just thinking to myself, this place has a bad feeling. Like, maybe bad things have happened here. And when I say here, I mean behind this motel or maybe behind the motel room walls. Or maybe just in this area in general. I don't know. It's just something off about it. As Lieutenant Brewer talks, from my perspective, there's a dumpster in view. It's just past his left arm. I ask him if he thinks it might be possible that John put these boys into one of these dumpsters and maybe they were emptied before authorities could search them. There's been a lot of theories, a lot of information that we have acted on uh, in reference to that, but absolutely. I mean, we see three dumpsters over here that, uh, you know, and I know way back when those were searched. We just have the tower hits, we just have the mind of John Skelton, um, what we know about him, and unfortunately it leads us to a place like this where we're talking about dumpsters and talking about landfills. Federal agents searched the area with local law enforcement in the beginning. Andy Arena remembers one search in particular. It looked like an old abandoned school or something, and I, it was one of the creepiest things that I've ever seen, but I remember in the middle of the night, just you know, searching this place, this abandoned, and there were people living in it. And I remember opening a door, and these people were in there living in this, in this place. You know, it was kind of spooky. Um, but you know, if you were going to dispose of someone, that was looked like a good location. We got back into the car, ready to head back to 112 East Congress Street, Morency. I personally do not believe that there could be. Um, you know, a group of people involved. If you remember, John claimed to have given the boys to an underground group. Uh, you know, if he would have given them to a group, that would involve a lot of um, moving parts. The way he described it is the, there was a, 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 some factions of this group or some individuals that came over to their house, to his house to meet the boys and actually brought other kids over there to see if they would be compatible with the boys. And so right then and there, that brings in um, 
you know, three or four to five individuals who would have knowledge of the Skelton Boys being out there. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if no one else in the world knows but him. Uh, because I also know that he is very um, sensitive about what people think about him. And could he live with the fact uh, with him telling someone else of what he actually did to the boys? I don't know if he has the ability to um, have the knowledge that someone else knows that he could have possibly killed his three sons. Here's Chief Weeks. Well, if you believe that John met with um, some secret organization, then I think that tends to tends to push you in the direction that you believe that they are with the secret organization. So I, I, I don't believe that at any point he met with any sort of secret underground organization that, that takes children. He's a very narcissistic individual. His life um, is completely revolves around um, himself. He is very much concerned about what people think about him and the perceptions people have about him. And the control and the power that he has and tries to have over people ultimately comes back to, I'm the only person in the world that exists. And everyone should feel sorry for me. Everyone should feel bad for me. Former FBI agent Andy Arena says John's ego is likely just one of many problems he had to deal with. I think you've got to obviously have some mental issues. Um, so for us to sit here and look at it from our own mental state, you know, I learned that a long time ago. You're not going to rationalize what um, somebody else is doing when you're sane. So, you know, to, to kind of figure out what he, he's thinking and why, I, you know, I gave up on that a long time ago. What I know about these types of people is that they're willing to um, do some pretty drastic things in order to prove their point. So they'll stop at nothing. They'll stop at nothing. And unfortunately, you have three boys who were the victims of um, his um, his selfish attitude and his um, his narcissism. It's it's very frustrating. Um, I have faith and hope that we're going to um, get to the bottom of this at some point, in some way, but uh, in just knowing what we know, um, it it's almost heartbreaking, really. I almost feel sorry for John Skelton because um, it would he would feel so much better. He would have a better quality of life if he was able to get this off his chest. Think about the burden of holding on to a secret like this. If you're John Skelton, you're holding on to this information, whatever it may be. A secret like this must eat away at your insides. What I can say about um, those interviews following his arrest was that he was extremely emotional, um, almost to the point of uncontrollable, um, inconsolable, and that type of despair, that type of emotional um, release is, to me, it doesn't make sense for someone who felt like they were going to get their kids back after a short amount of time, and he's truly did this to keep the boys safe. My opinion, if you re just rescued your boys from a horrible situation and they were going to be safe, you would almost be... Um, I don't know if cocky is the right word, but you almost be arrogant or almost have a sense of confidence about you that um, I know I broke the law, but my kids are going to be safe and I'll see them again someday. Um, and that was not his attitude. It was one of complete emotional despair. And I have seen and heard that type of cry and that type of release dozens of times in my career. And without exception, those types of emotions that come out are done when you lose a loved one, when something so tragic happens that there's really no end in sight, there's no reason to live, there's no hope, and um, that is the kind of emotion that he displayed days after the boys went missing. We come to a stop, we're now in front of the Skelton's former home once again. Where are we now in the timeline? So. It is now about 6.45, 6.46 in the morning on Black Friday. And then we stand there talking with Detective Brewer about the hour and 45 minute gap. The gap in which the phone was either turned off, disabled, or went dead for some period of time. 
but the phone registered in Holiday City, and then it pinged back here in Morency again. The drive itself takes about 30 minutes. Investigators believe that that gap was more than enough time to drop the boys off. However, that was done. It is very strange for me just because of the hours and the time spent um, investigating this case and knowing that, you know, 10, 20 feet in front of us, um, this, that was the last spot that the boys were seen years ago. Um, every time I come here, it's, uh, it's an emotional time. Uh, it's very difficult because I just can't imagine um, what happened to these boys and uh, what John may have done to them or done with them. And so, yeah, it's very difficult. It's not an easy, not an easy case. Here's Andy Arena. I just talked to, to Chief Weeks um, recently. We were at a function together, and, and uh, you know, that's the first thing we talk about is the fact that we were not able to, to solve that, that it's still out there. And uh, I know it, it, it wears on him. I mean, I could see it in his eyes when he was talking to me. You know, he still thinks about that case every, every single day. He's right. You've heard Chief Weeks say as much. The case is still part of him. He and Brewer have their theories, and as far as they'll let on, they're the same. I have confidence based on the evidence that we collected that, you know, he, he, he did murder his sons and likely disposed of them somewhere. Um, as far as a working theory, how he did that, um, you know, I, th- I think it's anybody's best guess. And even though that theory is grim, Officer Brewer wanted to make sure that we all knew that hope was not lost. So the chance that the boys are still out there, that exists. Absolutely, you know, and that's that's the one thing about this case is that, you know, as investigators, um, we have to go to where the evidence points us. And um, due to the fact that their own father is the one that um, kind of holds all the keys here and he's not being helpful, our, our mind often goes to um, the worst happening, uh, but there's also this very strong possibility that, you know, that uh, this could have a happy ending. You know, I hope it does. A chance. That's what everyone is holding on to. A small chance. The possibility. Everyone is holding on to hope. On the next episode of Shattered, John Skelton's family is convinced he's innocent. You can't imagine John ever hurting his children. Never. Never in a million years. And I would give you my life if if that was any different. That's coming up on the next Shattered. If you have any information about this case, you can reach investigator Jeremy Brewer at 517-636-0689. And that's right into my desk phone. If you'd like to see and hear more about the Skelton Boys and what's going on in Morency and how we're covering the ongoing search, go to ShatteredPodcast.com. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Shattered Podcast. Last thing, please share this podcast with someone who might want to hear it. And rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. That's one of the best ways to make other people aware of the show. Thanks. We'll talk to you next week.